Colonial School Board of Education meeting to order for the January 2021 meeting. Our flag salute this evening will be led by Mr. Chris Pichu, Colonial School Board member. Chris, if you will, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, States of America. And, and to the, the Republic, Republic, to the Republic stands, for which the nation, nation under God. God under God, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you, Chris. Okay, our first order of business is the any additions or corrections to the board agenda. I have none, Mr. Laws. Any board member have any additions or corrections? Hearing none, do I hear a motion to approve the agenda as present it. Motion to approve the agenda as presented. Okay, do I hear a second? Second. It's been, been moved by Mr. McGee, second by Mr. Pichu to approve the agenda as presented. Questions? <clears throat> Hearing none, all in favor signify by your silence. Opposed, nay. The agenda is approved. Next order of business we have is the consent agenda. Consent agenda consists of the board meeting minutes, educational items, which would be for our choice and pro-choice uh, members, personnel moves, <coughs> business moves consisting of <coughs> items that we have out for approval for contract or our, and our financial reports. Do I hear a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? Yeah, I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. 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 Been, been moved by Mr. Schiller, second by Ms. Kennedy to approve the consent agenda as presented. Any questions? Hearing none, all in favor signify by your silence. Opposed, nay. Motion is carried, the consent agenda is approved. Next order of business we have is the Delaware School Boards Association Board Docs fee. A fee is for $8,500. Since Ms. Russell, thank you very much for sharing that number with me earlier. Do I hear a motion to approve the fee for the Delaware School Boards Association Board Docs so move. Do I hear a second? Second. I'm sorry, who who's the second? Leo. 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 Okay. It's been moved by Mr. Handy, second by Mr. McGee to approve the fee for the board docs program. Questions? Hearing none, all in favor signify by your silence. Opposed nay. Motion is carried. Next order of business we have is the collaborative agreement. Dr. Menzer. Uh, Mr. Laws, um, as, this, as the board knows, uh, prior to the pandemic in the spring, we were engaged in bargaining with all of our employee groups around their teacher, uh, their contracts. And we uh, had to pause those during the pandemic in the spring. Uh, and while we did end up moving forward with our AFSME bargaining group in the summer, uh, the remaining bargaining groups were put on pause uh, pending their desire to reach back out to the to come back to the table and, and re restart the process. Our teacher group uh, reached back out uh, somewhere in the early fall, maybe October ish, and we uh, came back to the table with them uh, and talked through a process of how it would look in the current environment. And we've had uh, both teams working uh, to come to this agreement that you have in front of you. Um, and we are uh, presenting it for the board's review and approval. Okay, do I hear a motion from a, any member of the board? 
make, I make a motion, motion, Mr. President. Ms. Kennedy, go ahead. I make a motion that we approve the collaborative agreement with the teachers of three and a half to ten times one year. All right. Do I hear a second? Second. It's been moved by Ms. Kennedy, seconded by Mr. McGee to consider the act upon the collaborative agreement with the CEA. Questions from members of the board? Hearing none, all in favor signify by your silence. Opposed nay. The motion is carried. So Mr. Laws, I know in the agenda it states that we'll have a, this is where generally the board president and myself and uh, the CEA uh, president, teacher union president would uh, come forward and we would do a signing at a table. Uh, we'll work through the logistics of the signature process with the uh, CEA and our, and our office staff in terms of how best to facilitate that. Um, I do know that uh, Ms. Fesmeyer is here uh, representing the, uh, the teacher bargaining group uh, with many of their other members. Um, just would like to uh, extend our, our thanks to them and the hard work that they've been doing uh, to uh, provide education to our families and our students. And um, we look forward to continuing to, to, move, uh, to move the needle of achievement for our students. And uh, we believe that this is a this collaborative agreement is a great step in continuing in the positive direction that we've maintained in Colonial. So just wanted to put that out there. And Ms. Fesmeyer is here. If you uh, had she any would like words to say, her. If she would like to say something, I would suggest that we give her the opportunity. Sure. Uh, Phil, you want to pull Donna in as a panelist and see if she has a few words to share? She's in now. You're in there, Donna. Okay. Hello. Hello, Donna. Hello, board members, Mr. President, Dr. Menzer, thank you very much. I have to say thank you to the team, the whole team, both district and CEA for a um, very collaborative agreement. Um, it's, it's such a pleasure to be a part of the relationship that we have together and we work together and I really feel like Colonial would not be where we are today without that relationship and i think it goes a long way so thank you all thank you thank you very much okay any questions or comments for Ms. fesmeyer thank you donna thank you all right okay our next order of business that we have will be for the um Superintendent's report. Yes, uh, Mr. Laws, uh, I'd like to start the superintendent's report tonight uh, with uh, to allow the board to have a conversation with our, our student representative, Cheyenne Faircloth. She's joining us fresh from her, I hope, victory over DMA in girls basketball. We'll let her fill us in and, and see what happened there. Um, but she's, uh, she's going to share a little bit with you about her experience uh, at uh, William Penn this semester, uh, how things have been going in the remote uh, environment, and then uh, the we would you know the board uh, could share a little bit with her uh, around uh, board parliamentary procedures and kind of have a conversation around that. So uh, we're going to let her kick it off and have her fill us in on how things have been going. Cheyenne, as soon as you get yourself squared away, let us know there. There we go. We can see it. There now. we go. Still got the uniform on. All right. So she definitely just made it right in under the wire. Yeah, I, I just got home. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so well, let's let's ask the first question. Let's okay. ask the first question. What was what was the score? Um, well, it was sixty to fifty-three, I believe. I may be wrong, but it's it around there. We won. We won. Uh, there you go. Uh, there, there you go. There you go. All right. <laughs> All right, carry on. Um, just to give a little bit about my experiment, my experience as a um, student during like remote learning and everything. Um, there's definitely um, pros and cons um, to being online. 
Um, I'll start with the pros. Um, you can do like all of your work like on your own time. Like honestly, your learning is really um, like in your own hands, and um, you can have more on one more one on one time with your teachers, like in office hours and things like that. Um, but at the same time, there's not always like as much class participation or um, like people asking questions and stuff like that. Um, sometimes it's harder, it's hard to like pay attention while you're like staring at a screen all day. Um, it's like, sometimes it can start to seem like you're living like the same day over and over. But, um, my biggest takeaway would probably be that like, we're all in it together. Like it's a, it's really a learning experience for both like the students and the staff. Um, because most of my teachers like haven't ever, um, taught in this format. So it's really um, us all working together. And like in that way, it kind of um, connects us and like brings us together almost. Thanks, Cheyenne. Does anybody have any, feel free to ask Cheyenne any questions uh, about- Cheyenne, I'll, I'll, I'll start off a little bit. As, as we've discussed previously, of course, our board operations basically operates under the guidance of the Roberts Rules of Orders. Um, and I know that we have spoken before about whether you have any experience with that. I understand that you are part of a organization that you have used the parliamentary procedures through Robert's rules. Yeah, I believe so. Can you fill us in a little bit on what you've done with that? Um, like how it went or. Yeah. Well, what, what did you, I, I guess the question is, is what experience did you have with that? Did you, uh, getting in depth with it? Is it basically just running a meeting or listening to um, someone run the meeting? How was that? It was, um, it was, okay, so it was for Trium Music Honor Society. So we had like a president, vice president, treasurer, everything like that, um, a secretary, like um, people who take notes and stuff like that. So it really was like um, very student led. Um, the admin for our um, society are very like, um, and then they are making it a student-led organization. So it was really like, we really had a lot of control over the meetings. It was very organized. Um, everything went smoothly, like down like the chain of command and it, it works really, really good. Okay. Now, and any of your classes and whatnot, have you studied any parliamentary procedure, Robert's rules or anything like that? No, I don't believe so. Okay. What a, and I meant to do this earlier today, but I, I just got tied up with work. I have uh, 10 pages of uh, actually five documents and covered on two sides. So I'm going to I'm going to send to um, Miss Russell to get out to you and other members of the board. They're actually and don't get upset with me when I say this are actually cheat sheets to <laughs> how you can effectively run uh, a meeting. So it's it's basically some snippets of uh, items from Robert's rules, okay? How do you do motions, which has priorities, motions, and those type of things. So once we, once I send those to you, or once Ms. Russell sends those to you, I would like for you to take a, take a look at those. And then, uh, Jeff, have we given um, Cheyenne a, a copy of the Robert's rules yet? I don't believe we've given her uh, a copy of Robert's rules. We as far as I know, and I'm, I'm, I, I didn't ask to do that unless you directed Ms. or gave Mrs. Russell that task. I did. I, I did not. I think it would be handy if we get get her a copy of the uh, Roberts rules. We all we all have paperback copies, or we all should have paperback copies of that. Uh, mm -hmm. Any other board member that does not, make sure that you uh, uh, get those get get a copy of those, or we'll, or let let Miss Russell know so we can get you a copy of those because they are they are handy to ha have. Sure. So if we could get those to Cheyenne, I think it would be a uh, piece of information that, and a resource that you could have to be looking through and to learn more about the operation of a board and how we go through that. Um, again, Cheyenne, it's, it's a guide for us. It's not that we follow it letter by letter all the way through because there's 2,000 ways you can get to the same end, but we try to use that as a guide. So, okay. All right. Any other questions or comments from members of the board for Cheyenne? Yes, I have one for you. Go ahead, uh, Ron. How do your teammates feel about you being part of the board now? Uh, or how do they um, give you feedback? Most of them don't know. <laughs> um, and if they do, 
they haven't said anything. So. Yeah, okay. so you're saying we need to advertise it more? Yeah. yeah. So, yes. Oh, all right. We need to, <laughs> Gabe Phillips is in the audience, so cue Gabe times, Phillips. It sounds like, right? Again, <laughs> let's push that out in the student social media world. That's not going to be an embarrassment, Cheyenne. Huh? <laughs> yeah, we definitely want to put it out there that you are on the board. That's a good. That's good stuff. Gabe just chatted back. He's got it. We're good there. Good point, Ryan. Good question, <laughs> Andy. <you. laughs> All right. He was in the it, colonial clippings, I believe. Uh, it like was in the clippings, but we need to ago, right? we push it in some other some other spaces. That's awesome. Apparently, uh, we need a separate student section. You know, so they're seeing it. Too. Yeah. <laughs> so you haven't heard any comments from any other students in school, Cheyenne? Um, I've heard a couple comments from some of my friends and like. Um, people who like know people on the board or people um, who like, who saw it on Instagram or like Facebook and stuff like that. So. Okay. All right. Ron, anything else? No, that's it. All right. Any other members of board? Chris, anything? Lucy? No? Cheyenne disappeared on us here real quick. Rick? Hey, Cheyenne. Hello. Hey, how tall are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm 5'8". Okay, so you're not center material, but you're a pretty good guard then. Yeah, I'm, I'm a forward. Yep, oh. perfect. <laughs> right. Does Leo have anything? Nope. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much, Cheyenne. And again, uh, I'll get this information scanned and sent to... Uh, to Miss Russell tomorrow, so she can distribute it to uh, to you as well as the other board members to have for uh, for their okay, use. Sounds good. All right. Okay. All right, Jeff. Um, so then the second part of my report, just going to give the board a return uh, from winter break update. As the board knows, you receive all the emails that go out to staff and all those other ones that I forward along <clears throat> related to announcements and updates to the community. <clears throat> but as you know, well. You, you know, we returned in person this week. Um, yesterday and today were our day one and two, I think second time or maybe third time, depending on how you're counting day ones. We had day one virtual, day one face-to-face, -face, uh, another day one back to virtual, and then now another day one face-to-face. -face. So we're, we're doing quite a few number uh, first days here. Um, yesterday uh, was, it, was an exciting day for our special programs in our special program schools. Um, it, you know, it's good to have students back in the school. Um, it's good to see staff excited to see students um, in, in the buildings. Um, we've made a commitment to the community, as we've stated in multiple, multiple communications, that we are going to, uh, you know, put our, all of our resources behind maintaining face-to-face -face or in-person instruction for those families who opted in. Um, we continue to invest in that. We continue to uh, demonstrate that um, uh, belief in our actions. We meet uh, the full administrative team from the district level meets for an hour each day at two to three o'clock to assess where we are with uh, our staffing and our ability to operationally support instruction and or transportation, nutrition services and maintain our buildings. Um, and then from that point, we're making uh, calculated decisions around whether or not a classroom or a certain area of um, the uh, a school or a building needs to be uh, put back into virtual. Um, we've really involved a lot of senior level administrators to support our building principals, uh, as well as our um, supervisors in operation to make sure that we are uh, safely staffing our buildings to provide instruction uh, for our students. Um, just to give an example of how it, it, it works, um, we had a situation at George Reed that evolved over a couple of days and Sunday evening, it um, didn't get uh, a little worse. So uh, the decision was made to put one class in virtual uh, until we could adequately staff that classroom. Um, there was a variety of uh, personnel issues that came up that made it difficult for us to uh, uh, sustain one classroom of students. So those families were contacted Sunday evening by administration at the school 
Um, and we, you know, are main monitoring that situation with the goal of bringing that class back on next, uh, my understanding is, is as of this moment, next Tuesday uh, is when we should be able to, to bring them back in. So we're making real time nimble decisions around what the impact of community spread is having on our staff as well as on our students. Um, so we feel that that is a lesson that we've learned from the fall where we were not, we were not in that position where we had um, the structures in place and nor did we have the, the understanding of the magnitude of the, what happens when one person tests positive and the quarantining and the close contact and all the things that go into it, not to mention when you have one, but when you have six, seven in one afternoon, and then the next day you have five before you start the day. So the rat, when those start happening, we learned that we need more hands on deck and we need to put more resources on the table to help support those staff and who are providing face-to-face -face, uh, opportunity. Um, we continue to run our virtual academy. Um, one of our super highlights that I continue to point out is Parent University. It's basically a CSD YouTube series that supports uh, families during remote learning. Um, we've gotten some really great feedback Mind you, you know, we're not blind to the fact that remote learning is, is, a, is a challenge. We, we understand that connectivity issues do cause challenges, as well as understanding of the technology itself um, by many of our parents and our families. But, and we continue to work through that and provide, the, provide them support. Uh, just a couple of the comments that we've received recently is, you know, a a thank you that the virtual education and classroom support has been very well run. Uh, as a parent of a second grader and future colonial student, these sessions have been tremendous in helping support, support my student during remote learning. My favorite parent you session was Sora and Dolly Parton Imagination Library. After learning about these programs, I signed up for free monthly books from Dolly Parton Imagination uh, Imagine library, imagination library for my one-year-old and seven-year-old. They're enjoying the access that they've been, re they've been receiving in Colonial. This one's uh, great. Uh, remote learning has been a real challenge for me since I too am working from home and can't always monitor my students' Colonial Chromebook. Your session on the parent smartphone app securely has really helped me in managing my students' Chromebook, ensuring that they're completing work. Thank you. Um, then, you know, they also, someone also commented that thank you for providing both a parent phone help center and a parent support tech ticket system. Just knowing that I'm able to reach out for one-on-one -on -one tech support when needed has helped me alleviate my stress during remote learning. So, I mean, we, we recognize that there's stress and there's strain and there's concern, but, you know, the team, our technology team and our teachers have put together incredible models to help support families in this difficult time. Um, so that's one example of supporting families. Another is we have begun a, a learning pod at William Penn High School this week. It started yesterday where we have uh, contracted services with an outside organization to support students during the day who need support uh, or families and students who need support during remote learning. Uh, so they come to on site to William Penn and are, are uh, afforded a uh, a tutor per se that's going to help them through navigate their day in the virtual space and that's for the high school I, I believe they're slotted for 40 students um, to be a part of that learning pod and we've also are beginning a learning pod at McCullough in the very near future I'm not even going to say we're in the planning phases because it's happening so we are excited to offer that opportunity to uh, the families of McCullough through the same organization and the same concept to help our McCullough uh, staff and families re-engage their students in learning who need it with someone uh, who can help guide them through the virtual space. Um, winter athletics kicked off. We had our first round of uh, athletics today. Uh, while we were in our last PD before we came in here, I got a screenshot of the uh, basketball game at William Penn. Uh, we have a huddle camera system that provides a live stream for all uh, spectators. Um, we do, we are following DPH's guidance that was released last week where we are limiting uh, tickets to one, one ticket 
one spectator per athlete, but we have no, we are not providing tickets for visiting families. Um, and that is pretty consistent throughout the county and the state, at least at this outset of our return to face-to-face -to -face, uh, athletics for winter, um, winter sports. Jeff, if you could, could you please send out that link for those, um, you'd be able to I watch those things? I'll, I'll check with Matt Sable on how he does that, if it's team specific, like if there's an account. Um, um, and I know Gabe was involved in that and so was Phil in the installation. So they're hearing this. I'll make sure that we put that link up there. Gabe just put the colonialsports.com link in the chat. So it's probably it's on our Colonial Sports website. Um, and we should be able to we'll push that out to you in an email um, uh, this evening or tomorrow morning. Thank you. Um, just in the world of uh, COVID, the vaccination plan for 1B essential workers includes all employees or all people who work in schools and school systems. We've uh, received uh, a steady stream of communication over the last several days from the, from the Department of Ed around the prioritization process and how they're going to be managing it and how it's going to be delivered. In fact, I just literally got an email from Dr. Bunting um, this evening on top of an email I got last night that talks about um, how many staff we have in each category and then asking us to provide them further names and number further numbers around our contracted employees because they too are included our contract bus drivers uh, our contracted in agency staff such as jdg communities and schools reading assist crossing guards you could even put substitute teachers into this uh, essential uh, 1b essential worker um, category and then we'll wait for DOE to provide us the next round of information about the vaccination process. I will say that right now tonight uh, from 530 to 730 are the Newcastle County school nurses were afforded the opportunity to receive the round of vaccinations with the 1A group uh, at the Delaware City DMV. They were doing a drive up um, DMV, a drive up vaccination. Um, so we are getting uh, we are getting information. Uh, we are continuing to see progress on a plan forward with that. Um, Jeff, is part, is part of that going to be is who will be eligible to um, administer those those shots? Is there uh, is this, the question yeah. out there whether our nurses will be able to do it or does it have to uh, be? We, right now, the Department of Ed is contracting with the pharmacies, much like they do with the flu vaccine. We do with the flu vaccine. But there is no there has been no indication that our nurses are are being used at this part in the plan. Um, I, I know that there have been discussion that some of them are eligible and willing, but that's not DOE and the Department of, Ed, uh, Department of Health are running this program right now. And right now the plan is to contract and to utilize the CVSs, the Walgreens, the Rite Aids, the local pharmacies um, and do mass vaccination events as opposed to events at small, just events at buildings for a smaller number. So there's plans for mass events I just have not seen the final final plan on that. And we'll be pushing that out right to our staff. I literally shared that with our communications group um, 30 minutes ago. And I know that they'll be looking through it to pull out the relevant information to put in our staff update. It'll go out on Thursday to staff. And I know one, one part that you and I discussed yesterday was you were going to find out if the uh, board members were eligible underneath that as well. So that came up in our discussion today. Uh, uh, John Cooper, our COVID lead, uh, is part of been part of the conversation around the vaccination plan, and he has explained to me that the definition of the essential worker in the schools is to be, at this point, is to be determined broadly. And it's my inclination that we will include board members in our submission back to DOE uh, based on that conversation with him. So we're, we're going to put it on the, our list for Colonial and see what happens when they come out with the prioritized list, um, which is going to be coming out They're They're moving at a pretty quick pace in terms of setting this up. So I'm hoping to hear something probably by the end of the week or the beginning of next week. Well, I know the governor had an update on it this afternoon and his uh, weekly update to where he was going to start uh, trying to set up some mass uh, vaccination points. Yes. Yeah. He did mention that this, this afternoon in his 145 press conference. Thank you. Um, the last two, well, the, the last couple items real briefly, uh, we did 
right before the break, secure our FY21 final enrollment. And we uh, have uh, fallen under our 98% guarantee from the last, what we negotiated last spring. And therefore we are uh, going to be receiving 90, we, the following week I received the notice that we'll be receiving our 98% uh, guarantee with an additional 1% one-time payout for us to use uh, for uh, other, for continued staffing in division two and three uh, and other funding buckets outside of division one, uh, as long as we assured the Department of Ed that there will be no layoffs this year. And uh, Emily uh, sent that assurance uh, last week. So we are on, on dock to get a 98, 99% funding for this school year for our staffing um, based on our enrollment. And what was our final number? Our final number was 9,700 and something. I can't remember the two other digits on there. Um, I, I actually, I have a link to the memo here. If you give me one second, I can kind of take a peek. Uh, it was 9,795. All right, 97, 95. Thank you, Ms. Falcon. I appreciate that. I should have just asked Emily to begin with because I know she knows it right off the top of her head. Um, and as you heard, uh, as you may have heard earlier when we were coming into exec, um, we were wrapping up a, a continued equity PD workshop that we it's ongoing in Colonial. Um, I strongly encourage you to check out our website uh, under the About Us tab. There's an equity uh, overview of the work that's been ongoing for several years in Colonial, and we, are, uh, we have not backed away from that work. Um, our district equity work group continues to work and lead us in that charge, along with the leadership team from Colonial's uh, district office, as well as our consulting group, Insight Education. Um, some of the things that you're, you could, you'll see going out in the communications that obviously the board gets when the staff get them is, you know, uh, district equity team is now uh, developing book studies. They're in their second round of book studies around white fragility. Um, and they have a new book study starting on, we want to do more than survive. Abolition is teaching in the pursuit of educational freedom. Um, those are just a small slice of some of the work that's going on uh, to, uh, engage, reflect, and act in Colonial around equity. Um, we have established school-based teams in the, for, so there's net, there was a, there is a district equity team in the, in the uh, fall and win, early winter, we began to uh, challenge and charge our buildings to develop equity teams and they've hit the ground running uh, in December. And the, the, the latest uh, iteration of our equity work now involves students. We are in the process of engaging them in the work as well. Uh, there are students on the district equity team now, but we're also looking to expand their role in the conversation. And then lastly, I'll leave you with the strategic planning process still continues. Uh, we have staff sessions scheduled through J uh, February 24th, and we're in the process of preparing a release to the community for parent sessions uh, that'll be coming out in the next couple of weeks. Um, that's it for my update this evening, Mr. Laws. Okay, any questions for Dr. Menzer from any members of the board? None? Okay, next order of business we have is the board policy manual. Dr. Menzer? Uh, as the board will see, we're presenting two policies for first read. Uh, uh, they are uh, policies that are not um they're not the concepts are not new the terms are not new but these are things that uh or have been in board policy before but they've been lumped in together or lumped into other areas uh with some new regulations coming out of the federal government and through the state uh we were required to separate these two uh policies uh clearly and so we're just presenting a foster care policy and a mckinney vento policy for your review and then we'll uh have a we'll uh consider their uh consider a request for their approval in um february okay 
can you or a member of your staff give a brief overview of what the McKinley Bento board policy is for the audience? Uh, the McKinney Vento board policy, I can pull it up really briefly. If Phil, if you see Ed Stefan or John Cooper in the audience, they're more than welcome to join into this discussion. Otherwise, um, John's there. John's there. Okay. Yeah. Ed, why don't you pull John in and I'll let John walk through uh, this. It's his, his visiting teacher team is, is the ones who uh, kind of put this together for us. John, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening, President Laws, Dr. Menser, and the board. Um, there, the McKenney Vento is le federal legislation that regulates how schools work with students who are identified as being homeless. And the, uh, the definition of homelessness is, is fairly broad. It's not what people commonly may be think of as homeless. It includes folks um, who have unstable housing. It includes folks who um, are doubled up with somebody else. They don't have to be strictly speaking homeless, but uh, many of our students um, are living in hotels or are living with other relatives in an unstable housing situation. And in short, the main protections that we have for these students that we're required to do is we're required to limit um, barriers to registration. So for example, in some cases, these folks don't have the same type of paperwork that you and I might have to verify a lease or a deed or something like that. So we're required to limit the, the, um, the barriers to them registering. We're required to have what's called a best interest meeting on an annual basis to determine um, if a student should remain in uh, their school of origin, even if they've moved out of the district. So what this means is we are required to limit transitions for students who might have multiple residences in a given year. So this is a national thing. It's certainly not unique to Colonial to Delaware, but we have students that attend Colonial uh, because it's their home school, but they might live in Red Clay or Brandywine or Christina. But if they're uh, covered under McKinney Vento, then we provide transportation for those students to come to Colonial and we're required to review that on an annual basis. Um, and um, those uh, are the main provisions. The other part of it is just that we have, um, we're required to identify an individual who is responsible for coordinating this for the district and we do and as Jeff mentioned, Ed Stefan is in that position. We also have a, we're required to have a grievance policy um, and we're required to be able to hear any appeals or concerns or questions that anybody has. A couple, couple questions I have on that. It's my understanding that uh, an individual who falls underneath, underneath this policy is not required to have certain vaccination or other um, types of medical coverage, I guess, for, for a lack of better terms for right now. Yeah. Um, is that a true fact? Well, um, it gets tied to when a family is in the process of registering their child. And so typically we are required families to provide that proof of vaccination and their registration is contingent on that. So with families that are covered on e under McKinney Vento, we're required not to make their registration contingent on proof of the vaccination status. However, our school nurses always follow up with those families and work with them to secure the vaccinations. But we're, we, the idea is that some of these folks don't have the paperwork because of their living situation. Right. Uh, second question I have, you mentioned that uh, we provide transportation. What type of transportation do we provide to these individuals? Okay. So basically, and there is, uh, uh, there is some support this, at, at, uh, for this, but basically what it means is, as I mentioned earlier, typically we would only provide bus transportation for students who live in Colonial. It makes sense. They live within our district bounds. But what happens sometimes is a student might start the year uh, you know, living in Wilmington Manor, and then they end up, they might end up moving into Newark uh, in an apartment or being doubled up in, uh, let's say, by Thanksgiving. So what that really means is if that student is identified, and part of the process I, I didn't mention here, but there is a process to determine if somebody actually qualifies. Um, so it's not just anybody, but if a student does actually qualify, then we would send a bus to Newark to pick them up and bring them to William Penn and take them home at the end of the day. Secondly, what approximately what percentage 
of our students fall underneath of this policy? I can I can give you a specific number. I I know that in past years um, we were using a figure of over the course of a given year we had about 500 students that were either covered under McKenney Vento or in foster care. So um, it's a fairly large number at any one point. That's not the number, but kids go in and out of the system. So we had, uh, most recently, we had just under 500 unique individuals who were either foster care or McKinney Vento. So if an individual, Right. If an individual falls underneath of the foster care, do we provide them transportation as well? Um, no. Um, well, actually, yes, we do. If they move out of district care, or whatnot? In some, in, yes. In some ways, foster care is considered a subset of McKenney Vento, even though it's for different reasons. Um, it's considered a subset. Those people who are in foster care do have stable housing. By definition, they're placed with a family. Um, but they do, they are entitled to those uh, transportation provisions. I guess my point of, the, of bringing these questions up is more of an information for all those who are listening is yeah. this is just more of some of the unseen costs that we as a district is responsible for, for our students that the general public may not necessarily be aware of. So okay. we have the, um, we have the, um, the cost for transportation and other costs that are that are involved with that as well too. So thank you very much. Okay, so that's, those uh, two policies are posted for for reading. And uh, this is a, for a first, first read to the board. And the intent will be that in our February meeting, we'll bring these policies up for comment. And if, uh, if there's no additions or corrections or questions on those, then we bring those up for passage. Uh, anything to add to that, Dr. Menzer? No, just that uh, both these documents have been reviewed by legal counsel um, prior to presentation. So I just, just to add that in there. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Next order of business we have is the tax abatement request. Yep. I'm, I'm going to turn say to this is probably Ms. Falcon. You very well stated, Mr. Laws. Ms. Falcon is up. Uh, good evening, board members. Good evening, Colonial community. Um, this evening, I am bringing forward a, a tax credit request on behalf of the Brandywine School District. Um, as you may be aware, because of the Newcastle County um, Tax District, <clears throat> the four districts share a portion of their revenues. So anytime a tax credit or a tax um, abatement of some sort comes forward, all four districts must approve that request since the revenues um, are shared among us and, and the impact is felt in all four districts. In this case, it is a residential situation where the county and Brandywine School District have agreed to um, a credit of five years, going back five years. Um, it amounts to about 10% of the property tax that this house um, was assessed at. There was apparently a, a, an anomaly or a, a mistake in how the, the house was actually um, classified and that led to them being overtaxed. So the total amount that they're receiving from, um, from all of the school tax credit is about $1,300. Um, I believe that some of the information that you might have been provided indicated that our portion was $1,300. That's actually the total for all four districts. Our share, um, I didn't get an estimate from the Brandywine CFO, um, but I did a quick calculation and I don't, I don't anticipate it being any more than about $260 at the most. Um, that would come out of our tax receipts. So that is, that's the request that I have before you this evening and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Ms. Falcon, First of all, do, do you I hear this? Do I, oh, I'm sorry. Do I hear a Take motion? Can I ask to, a question real quick? Uh, once we get a motion on the floor, the answer to that question oh, would okay. be yes, but we need a motion on the floor first. Do I hear a motion from a member of the board to approve the tax credit? Make a motion, Mr. President, to approve the tax credit as presented by Ms. Falcon. Do I hear a second? It's been moved by Mr. McGee, second by Ms. Kennedy to approve the tax credit as, as presented by Ms. Falcon. Mr. Pichu, you have a question. 
Uh, Ms. Falcon, do you see that uh, this issue coming up anywhere else across the county or is it really just a one-off scenario? Uh, this specific situation seems to be a one-off scenario where I believe the homeowners were doing some renovation work and through that renovation work were made aware that the way their house would, was classified when they purchased it, um, which was in the mid 80s, um, was actually overstated. The construction um, value was overstated in how it was classified. So I, I believe it is a, an isolated incident um, from a residential perspective. We, we see, honestly, we see more um, commercial entities going forward to the county and appealing their assessments on um, economic basis, not necessarily um, mistakes or you know anomalies with the with the tax assessment basis. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Right. Any other questions by members of the board? Hearing none. All in favor, signify by your silence. Opposed, nay. Motion is carried. Next order of business we have is the de deferred maintenance expenditure plan. That is also going to be uh, Ms. Falcon as well. Okay, Emily, she shows yours. All right. Um, so for this portion, I don't have a presentation, but I'm going to share my screen briefly with you. Um, uh, back in, I believe it was back in September, the, we, we discussed um, a, an expenditure plan for the use of voluntary school assessment funding, um, which is basically building impact fees that have accumulated over time. Um, in FY20, the General Assembly decided to expand the use of those funds for um, minor capital improvement projects. The request that we sent down to the department in September included a line item for, um, for the, the installation of, of turf fields. Um, the department in reviewing that request <clears throat> um, sought legal counsel guidance on, on that specific project. And because um, the specific language in the bond bill mentions that school improvement, or um, let me I have the language up on a separate screen here. Let me read from it directly. <clears throat> um, funds to be used for minor capital improvements in to school buildings in each respective district. Uh, so the those three words to school buildings, uh, the Department of Education's legal counsel is interpreting that athletic athletic fields and athletic facilities were not contemplated as an allowable use by the General Assembly um, when they placed that language in the bond bill. So they came back to us and said, you know, we, we, can't, we can't move forward with the turf field project. Um, and because, because of the nature of the language they wanted to put, it, wanted us to put a revised um, request in front of you for approval. So what you see in front of you um, is basically everything that we looked at in September um, with, <clears throat> with the exception of, we did add a, a small project for Wilmington Manor Elementary. Um, the situation there with the, the storm and groundwater is that the, the, those issues are leading to seepage of groundwater into the floor of Wilmington Manor, causing the floor itself to become, um, <clears throat> you know, to have, uh, have mold issues um, that we are constantly remediating and staying on top of, but we want to try to address the source of the problem by, by dealing with the groundwater and remediating that. Remediating that. So that's a, uh, the only other change besides the removal of the turf fields project. So I'm putting this forward um, this evening for approval again, so we can resubmit it to the department and move forward with these projects. Okay, well, I, I have a question, but we'll have to get a motion on the floor first before we go with there. So do I have a motion to approve the revised assessment plan, or a proposal for VSA funds? Go move. By your second. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Handy, seconded by Mr. Schiller to approve the resubmission questions. Um, looks to me like on here, 
Ms. Falcon, you have also removed the chiller replacement for $1 million plus dollars off of that from the original uh, submittal. Why was that taken off? Uh, that, that was actually um, taken off in September as well. Um, we, <clears throat> we got some additional information. I believe we got a second opinion from a different contractor on that specific chiller and we were able to do some repairs to it that did not require replacement. So um, because we, we went in a different direction on that particular project, um, we were able to take it off the list. Well, we can't, we can't put in for the funds that it costs to repair it versus replacing it? Um, I think that was just a build with our minor capital improvement budget. Um, it was a much cheaper project at that point. And um, because these funds can be used, um, you know, pretty much for the same type of projects, <clears throat> we just decided to cover it with our minor capital expense. And uh, then with, with, the, with doing those repairs, how long do we extend the life of that, that chiller? Is it substantial or, is, or are we just kicking the can down the road? I, I would need to, um, to reconnect with, with Mr. Lambert, our facility supervisor on that. Um, it, it has been a while ago that we made that decision and I would have to refresh my memory on that. But um, obviously the life cycle of the, of the chiller, you know, is, is still what it is. I, I believe we were going to get another, um, another few years out of it, but it was not an immediate need the way that we thought it was at one point over the summer. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I mean, if it's, if it's going to buy a substantial time, I'm all for it, but if we're only putting a bandaid on it, then I would think we need to keep it on there, but I will what, defer what is, to yeah. I'll defer to Mr. Lambert's uh, opinion on that. One of the things, Ted, that with when we brought Ted Lambert on board two years ago or so, he we that the putting the bandaid on something of that magnitude is really uh, not occurring. I mean, he is he's uh, effective and efficient in his decision making around what's going to be the best fiscal impact as well as the best. Uh, impact on the building. So I would concur with Emily, not even having been in the second discussion. I was in the original round of discussions when this job came up, but I would suspect that we're going to get our worth out of whatever that replacement was uh, based on uh, Ted's decision making around many jobs like this. And I, I would agree with that too. I think, I think we'll be okay, but I just needed to ask that question for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a little disappointed in the fact that we can't use it for other facilities upgrades that we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's other options that we need to discuss. And uh, Jeff, you and I did have some uh, brainstorming on that earlier today. So I know you're going to start working on some of those mm -hmm. ideas. So, And in, in, in the next couple of months or, or so, we'll be, bringing forward some different conversations around those uh, topics that we discussed. All right. Any other questions in regards to the motion that's on the floor? Hearing none, all in favor signify by your silence. Opposed, nay. Motion is carried. Anything else, Ms. Felton? I, Ted, just to be clear, the conversation definitely revolves around your disappointment and our inability to use this this funds for uh, other things related to school functionings, the turf fields and athletic facilities. So um, I just want to be clear to those who are listening that that's what that you were disappointed in that. And I think it's important that, you know, it doesn't sound like it was a, a secret. And um, we definitely will be relooking at that opportunity and how we can improve those uh, facilities uh, and and um, for the for the community moving forward. Well, I think that, that the point needs to be very clear to people is that um, this portion of this was not just from the use of from an athletic perspective. These facilities are used for not only our students student athletes. It's also for our organizations such as our band to be able to. Uh, proudly be able to have competitions that they've they travel around all over the uh, mm -hmm. region to go to on the homes to be able to host those versus use using the facility like we have in the past for blue rock stadium let's have it at our own home mm -hmm. um, i think it's also a, a lost opportunity to where we're able to put the facilities into shape to where our community can use it as well as our, our mm -hmm. school facility so 
I'll get off my soapbox on that. <laughs> I know, uh, you know this is this has been one of my my uh, uh, my um, wishes to get into place for what Rick it, it, ten years probably that we've been discussing this. So uh, I think it's something that we need to keep our nose to the wheel on this to keep this pushing forward because it's it's a benefit for not only our students but for the community. Understood, Mr. Laws. Rick, let him stay off his soapbox. <laughs> yeah, <he'll stay> <laughs> yeah. It does go back a ways, though. It goes back to when uh, Frank Lamaster came in, uh, um, uh, did a presentation to the board for um, installation of the um, turf field at William Penn back then. Yeah, so, yeah. we've been a kicking. Lot of yeah, we've been kicking this around for a while. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's the co and the cost is more than doubled from what what it was at that point in time too. So, but anyhow, our next order of business we have, Miss Falcon, do you have anything else for this? <laughs> no, that that I'm done for the month. Thank you so much. Okay, Doctor Men, is there anything else? No, that's all for updates and action items, Mr. Laws. All right, uh, next order of business we have is the Delaware School Boards Association updates. Any of our representatives for legal, DSBA legal, have anything to report? Uh, Mr. President, the um, January meeting was canceled due to the surge in the COVID, and it will be back on in February. Okay. Well, this topic we just went over would be one thing you should be able to go back for legal on to have them include whatever the school districts need. <laughs> are you you're going to keep going with this aren't you mr laws you're not going to let I it must, go <laughs> I, must, I most certainly am all right okay how about from dsba i'm sorry i'll put it on the agenda oh leo stop <laughs> <laughs> all right dsba board of, board of directors anything None. Okay, let's go to our next order of business. Items removed from the consent agenda. We had none. Items added to or deleted from the agenda. We had none. Public comment. Do we have any? Uh, no, we do not. We did receive a public comment uh, early last week. Uh, we believe it was more of a just a seeking help and assistance with assistance with technology. And uh, Phil and the tech team and the staff at Wilbur were able to at least uh, do something because I don't believe the parent who put that in is in the audience. So I, at this point, we have no public comment. Okay, good. All right, any other items by members of the board? Hearing none, do I hear a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Do I hear a second? Second. second. <laughs> All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. All righty. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a good evening.